I love cooking and I love teaching people how to cook. Good food is so important, not just for our health, but for our temperament, and it doesn't need to be complicated. For this series, I've created a set of menus which I hope you will try, either as individual dishes or as a complete and balanced meal. We're so lucky to have some of the best raw ingredients in the world. Let's make the most of them. When you mention chilled soup, people usually think of summertime in gazpacho, generally made with cucumber, peppers, tomatoes, garlic and spring onions. But there are plenty of other cold soups, and many of them can be enjoyed not just during the summer, but throughout the year. The chilled cucumber and grape soup I'm going to show now not only tastes fresh with unexpected combinations of flavour, but it looks amazing. I have all my ingredients ready for the chilled soup, which can be prepared a few hours ahead of time, which is part of the beauty of this particular dish. So, nice firm green cucumber, which I'm going to grate on the coarsest part of an old-fashioned grater. These graters have slightly gone out of fashion, but honestly, they really still have an important place in the kitchen. Mind your fingers when you get down to the end. You can offer it a little bit up to the to the hen's bucket or the compost heap. Okay, there we go. That's so far so easy. Now, the rest of my ingredients, grapes. Seedless grapes, if you wish. If not, you'll have to remove the seeds. So, just off the stalk. And then you can halve them if they're small. Or what I like to do is just sort of slice them into sort of about four slices like that. And if you come across a little pip like that, if you can bear it, just take it out. These are supposed to be seedless, by the way, but there you go. Great, that's those. They all go in with the cucumber. Cucumber and grape, as you can imagine, is a really refreshing uh, combination of flavours and two lovely textures. Then the rest of the ingredients are really very straightforward. I've got some beautiful, natural, unsweetened, this is actually organic yoghurt. Cucumber and yoghurt, you could sort of be in the Middle East. So we add that in. So that is that. Now, apple juice. Apple juice and cucumber, apple juice and grapes, all really good together. And then perhaps the unusual ingredient here is elderflower. So I'm using elderflower cordial. So I put in two tablespoons first and then I taste it. And if it needs a little more, I can always add it in then. So just mix that around and we're going to season it with some salt and pepper. So a little pinch of salt and some pepper. I mean, it's amazing in this country, for, many, for, for as long as any of us can remember, elderflower was regarded as being a weed. It just sprung up wherever it wanted to all over the countryside. Now people are planting elderflower orchards to keep up with the demand for elderflower cordial and elderflower champagne and so on. So that's everything in there at this stage. Um, so I'm just going to have a little taste, just so it's neither too sweet are too sharp and I'm tasting a bit of the cucumber and the grape together so I'm getting an accurate reading of the flavour. Mm. It's delicious. I mean it couldn't be much easier. So what I'm going to do with that now, I'm going to chill it. It chills for about an hour. You could make this early in the morning for serving that evening. I'm going to decant it into this bowl and then when I'm serving it, I'll serve it in this bowl so all I'll have to do is garnish it then at that point. So maybe not so gorgeous looking yet, but when we finish this with our radishes and flowers and so on, it really will be a great thing. All the prep done ahead, easy as pie. This is going off to the fridge. So the soup has been chilling for an hour and it's now nice and cold. Not too cold, but sort of fridge cold. And for the final presentation of the soup, I need the rest of my ingredients, which are going to add colour and visual interest, but also lots of lovely flavour and texture. So I've got some lovely radishes. Um, I'm just going to use the, the sort of root part of the radish today. So you can slice them by hand, or I'm going to use a mandolin. Like that. These are crispy, peppery, lovely. When you're using your mandolin, be very careful, or use the safety guard that comes with us. So lots of those. Then the other ingredient I'm going to use, which is going to add sweetness and beauty and visual interest, is some pomegranate. So to extract the seeds from the pomegranate, I'm not going to use all of this, so the rest of it I'll keep for my breakfast tomorrow morning. Cut it in half, 
and inside them beautiful ruby coloured seeds, glistening, shiny. So, turn the pomegranate upside down, stand back a little bit because it tends to spatter. And then gently, just tap it like that to extract the seeds. And pomegranate is being lauded for all sorts of reasons apart from the delicious flavour. Also, it's um, regarded as being one of nature's sort of cholesterol busters. So that is that. Then I've got some little flower petals. I've got some cal calendula or marigold, and I've got, of all things, little broccoli flowers. So I can just start to scatter some of my ingredients over the top, like that. So the pomegranate seeds. I mean, if you only had the radish and the pomegranate, it already looks beautiful. Then um, a little clash of the little um, marigold blossoms. So those on there like that. And then these little broccoli flowers. So this is starting to look a bit like carnival, but that's fine. Uh, really cheering, kind of beautiful looking. The final thing I want to put on here is a little bit of mint. And that just freshens up the whole thing. So easy refreshing, full of all sorts of good things, very varied, and we know a varied diet is one of the keys to looking after ourselves. I, I think this is a lovely thing. Homemade fried chicken can be one of the most delicious and satisfying things to eat, and as popular as any dish I know. Traditionally, the chicken is soaked in buttermilk to tenderize it before being fried but I cook it differently by simmering the chicken in stock first. This cooks the chicken so that the frying is done mainly to crisp up the spice flour coating. So we need to get our chicken on cooking. So I'm going to poach the chicken for what will eventually be the fried chicken in some chicken stock. Now if you didn't have chicken stock to hand you could use water and maybe add in a little bit of carrot and onion as well so you're almost making a chicken stock as you go. And the advantage of doing this, apart from making the chicken taste so good, is that you have fantastic stock left over, uh, which you can use for soup or just to drink as a broth. Okay, these, those go in there. I'm going to bring that back to a simmer, and they'll simmer for about one hour. With chicken, there's no gray area. It must be cooked through. While that's happening, you can prepare your sauces, your accompaniments, and so on. So the first thing I'm going to prepare is the spiced flour. And this is the flour that we will turn the chicken in before we fry it. So I've got some plain white flour, to which I'm going to add some sesame seeds. So these give a lovely little crunch and a sort of a pop. White pepper, quite a lot of white pepper, and I'll get heat and fire from that. So the curry powder, and then finally some chilli powder for a little bit more heat. Okay, so good pinch of salt. So I'll give those a little mix. I'm going to mix them with my whisk and I'll use this to make the aioli. Right, the next thing to make is one of the two sauces that we're going to serve with the fried chicken. So I'm going to make what's called an aioli. So I've got some egg yolks. So I'll separate my eggs into a bowl. You can make this in a food processor if you want to, but I'm going to make it by hand. And this sauce also, by the way, is very good with fried fish in the same way as a spice flour would be. Um, save your egg whites, they'll keep in the fridge for easily a week, or you can freeze them. And they work absolutely perfectly when defrosted from the freezer. Now the rest of my ingredients here, I've got some tomato puree, or like a tomato paste. And this is full of lovely, sweet, concentrated tomato flavour. So that goes in. The oil is the last thing to go in here. And some chopped garlic, plenty of two large cloves chopped. Some chopped anchovy. If you have somebody in the house who doesn't like anchovy, you can leave them out. But honestly, um, they bring a delicious salty flavour uh, to the equation. A little bit of mustard. So, so far, you know, so strong, really. And then um, a little white wine vinegar, just about a teaspoon. Like that. So I've got some sunflower oil and olive oil uh, mixed in here. And because it's a mayonnaise, uh, we need to drip the oil slowly onto the uh, tomato, egg, mustard and so on. And gradually, the sauce just starts to get sort of creamy looking. You can add the oil in a little bit more quickly when the sauce starts to thicken up, but don't get carried away. There's only a certain speed at which the oil 
is absorbed or the other ingredients can absorb the oil and if you go if you add in too much oil in one go it may curdle if, if it does curdle on you don't throw everything out get another bowl and put another egg yolk into it and slowly dribble the curdle sauce whisking back onto the egg yolk and it will come back together and during that rather frustrating few moments when you're doing that you will have learned a lot that's the last going in so that's the consistency it is now so adding in some of the um, chicken poaching liquid so if the color changes the consistency changes and then what might be hard to understand why I might put it in at this stage given how strong and powerful all my ingredients have been so far are a few drops of lemon juice so lemon juice added to a sauce like this at the last minute has a completely different effect say for example than vinegar because it's more gentle but it really really elevates the flavor so a few drops like that and whisk that in so now you see we've got yeah it's a salmon color i suppose that's what you'd call it one final thing to go in here the perfect herb to marry with all of these ingredients is some coriander this sauce is made for a little green chopped coriander You'll note at this stage I didn't put any salt into the aioli. That's because there's a little salt already in the mustard when it's being made and the anchovies are quite salty. But we will taste it. Sometimes it takes a little and sometimes it doesn't. So that goes in and the green flecks, I always think, also improve the appearance of the sauce. Like that. Okay, little taste. It's very good. Today it needs salt. Tomorrow it might not. A little pinch and whoops, and that should be perfect. That can go back into the fridge now until your chicken is ready to cook and then we'll put everything together later on with our salsa and our nice crisp leaves. We produce our milk off grass in Ireland. Our butter has this creamy golden color. The taste has always been pure. It's as natural as the day my great-grandfather made the butter, which is so beautiful. So the um, chicken thighs and drumsticks that I poach in the chicken stock are completely cooked through. So I've got my oil heating. Now, when you're deep frying, you need to be very careful. You can use, of course, a purpose-built deep fry, which is perfect. If you don't have a deep fry with a thermostat built in, you can use a saucepan like I'm using with the oil, a deep saucepan with the oil not too high in the saucepan, and then I'm using a thermometer to make sure my oil is around 180 degrees. Then you can use your fingers for this if you want to. I usually use the tongs and just dip it in the buttermilk and then toss the chicken in the flour and then just drop them in. Don't, well, don't drop them in, just place them in nice and gently into the oil and they should sizzle on contact like that now you need to do this in batches because you don't want to overfill your deep fryer now we are make sure it's well coated and we're going to cook that until it's really lovely deliciously crispy and really well colored while that's happening if you can manage you can also just put together the ingredients for the salsa we have our rich aioli we have some crisp salad leaves and for the simple salsa it's just uh, it could be chopped tomato. I've got some little cherry tomatoes here, which we've cut into quarters and eighths. And to that, I'm going to add a little red onion for a little bit of heat. Some chili for even more heat. A little bit of garlic. Lift the flavor of everything. Coriander, as you'd expect. And then a little squeeze of lime juice. We're giving a sort of a little kind of Mexican sort of flavor in here. This is a a, you know, a raw salsa, salsa cruda. Then very importantly, a pinch of salt and pepper. Mix that around like that. Now, let's see what's happening in here. So you have to lift up your chicken. Oh, this looks good. It looks beautiful and crispy and the sesame seeds are just sitting on the outside. Allow the excess oil to drip off. I'm gonna pop those on there. And then I'm going to pop these into my oven at 80, 100 degrees, just to keep warm. And I continue frying. So 
My fried chicken is in the oven, lovely and crisp, just keeping warm. Salsa, which will have a lovely cooling effect. Put that in there. I like to serve this on a big dish. It's, this is family style. This is getting stuck in. Then these lovely um, crisp baby jam lettuce leaves. Uh, that'll be lovely. Okay. And then the chicken. Just still nice and hot and crispy. So this is so many different flavors, textures, everything really for a sort of a perfect main course on one plate. And then I like lots and lots of coriander leaves. Like that, off to the table with that, inside or outside, al fresco or indoors, whichever it is, depending on the weather. And it should be sweet, succulent, crispy, and delicious. Few things seem as frivolous as popsicles, even the name is faintly ridiculous and you might prefer to call them by their old-fashioned name, Ice Lolly. The issue of making homemade popsicles used to be getting the moulds on the sticks, but these are now easily available. There's something whimsical about eating ice off a stick, and when you combine the element of fun with something that is really delicious to eat, then you're on to a winner. So I've got lovely really ripe strawberries for the popsicles and really ripe fruit is essential in almost any situation but particularly in the popsicles. So just take the, uh, the tops or the stalks off the strawberries and we're going to whiz these up with just a little simple syrup. So I've boiled some sugar and water to make a very simple syrup or what in other countries is called simple syrup. So pop these in. It's just so easy. Great, okay. It's not a huge amount of syrup. Um, we want them sweet, obviously, but not overly sweet. Lemon juice cuts through um, the sweetness of the sugar and also just elevates the flavor of the strawberries. So we'll just push this in. Make sure all your strawberries completely blended because little bits of strawberry will just freeze as little bits of strawberry and they aren't delicious like that. So we want it completely smooth. That is that. I mean, really, this is fast food. There's no doubt about it. It's fast food and easy cooking, which is a great joy. Nothing like having a few recipes in your repertoire that you almost don't have to think about and that are in, you know, in the freezer setting before, you know, before you can nearly say strawberry. So these little containers, I'm going to decant it into this jug just for ease and accuracy of pouring. The other thing is, if you taste this mixture at this stage, I have a little spoon here. It should taste slightly too sweet, only slightly. It tastes perfect, it tastes delicious actually, because it will lose a little of the sweetness in the freezing. So then, as accurately as you can, fill it into your containers. There we are. So I've got eight there. Lovely. Then, let's pop on the lid, and then pop in um, the little sticks. You can buy... Um, these containers which have got plastic sticks but there's nothing nothing like an old-fashioned lollipop stick to make you feel you're having the a sort of an authentic experience then these go into the freezer and freeze quite solid easy peasy as I say fast food the twill which will be crunchy and nutty are I think a perfect little biscuit to serve with the um, ice lollies so I've got some egg whites um, and then to that, I'm adding some sugar, a little caster sugar, and some flour. I mean, this, again, this is so quick and easy. The basic, it's a batter, really, that I'm making. And uh, the batter will keep uncooked in your fridge for a couple of days. So if you didn't use it all, or you were trying to get organized, um, you could keep uh, the batter in your fridge for a few days and, th and then use it. So just mix that around, and it's going to look quite odd looking, I think it's fair to say, at this stage. But I want to make sure the sh flour and the sugar are mixed nicely through the egg white. It gets sort of slightly gloopy looking, that's all fine. Then, to add a little bit of flavour, and to also to help them to colour, um, a little bit of cooled melted butter, which just goes in. So, it is an exceptionally quick, lovely thing. 
Now I'm going to add my almonds, and I'm using flaked almonds. And I'm taking the whisk out now, and I'm going to use my spatula again, because I don't want to break up the almonds, because um, we want the nice sort of shape of them. And it will look almond heavy, and that's the way it's supposed to. You could use nibbed almonds as well, but I like the appearance of the flaked almonds. Now, so I want to spread the mixture out really thinly in little discs onto a tray which I've lined with parchment paper so it won't stick. So like that, and then with the back of the spoon just spread it. And you want to almost be able to see through the batter. It's another of what I call my good things, which is an expression I know I use too often, but it's a fact they're good things. There we go. So these are going into my preheated oven approximately 10 minutes. Lovely. So when the tweel are ready, you need to be organized. So I've got a rolling pin, which I can mold the tweels on, or I've got one of these little special molds for doing the job. It's also used for baguettes as part of the process of making baguettes. Now, the colour we're looking for is exactly this sort of lovely toasted colour, so plenty of flavour. I like to then carefully just slide that off there. I find it doesn't slip as much when you do that. Then I need my palette knife to very quickly slide those off and put them rounded side down in there where they form a little tweel or tile shape. The, the tweel refers to the shape of a continental roof tile, which is like that. If you're using a rolling pin, you just drape them over the rolling pins. You don't need any specialist piece of equipment here. So they will cool really quite quickly. You could make those hours ahead. Now, with regards to unmolding the ice lollies, take the moulds out of your freezer about sort of 20 minutes or half an hour ahead of time and then just as soon as they come away easily like that I do this hours ahead of time and then I wrap them in a little piece of parchment paper which is practical and also I think looks rather nice so they could go back into my freezer until later on this evening or tomorrow but I'm pretty much ready to serve these now so I've got a little tray uh, looking Definitely frivolous, to add to the whole frivolous theme. Some ice cubes, and I've used some bay leaves because I like the look of them. And also, they just help the ice lollies to sort of sit up. Put that in there. Put that in the ice just helps just to keep them nice and chilly. At this point, now you see where our little biscuits have formed perfect, beautiful little crisp tweels. Lovely. If you fail in your tweels, you just serve almond flats. And if anybody um, uh, raises an eyebrow at your almond flats rather than your almond tweels, well, it's up to you what you tell them to do themselves.